Hello, good morning, good morning. How are you? <clears throat> it's been a while. Oh, yoga. <clears throat> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, yes, no. So, I hope you're well. As you can see, it's a lovely sunny day. Uh, what can I tell you? We're uh, coming up to the summer holidays. The uh, the full relaxation from the COVID rules is going to come in next Monday. It's uh, Thursday today. Uh, now, I've just put the fees up. We don't do it very often. Uh, that, by which I mean we do it less than once a year. We don't have a particular date on which we do it. We don't do it on the 1st of April or, you know, to coincide with our financial year or anything. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> My spare wheels rattling around like a back of badly stack, stack of plates. But uh, I'll, um, I'll see if I can fix that. Uh, yeah, so, um, so when do we raise our fees? Now, we raise our fees when, in my... I have a gut feeling that things are not as profitable as they should be. Uh, and that's good because basically what we do is we use market forces. If we think we're, uh, you know, if we get an influx of people who seem particularly enthusiastic to book in for their route fillings here, where they've had quotes elsewhere, uh, and uh, at the end of the month I don't have quite as much money in the bank as I need or would like, um, then we seriously think about putting fees up. And the second thing is we don't muck about when we put fees up. We put them up, I put them up 10%, which as far as a pay rise is, is a dream, isn't it, for most people, uh, for most dentists in fact. But uh, I'll just, uh, as I say, we don't do it every year, so when we put them up, we put them up, and we put them up because the prevailing mood is that money is not buying as much as it used to, uh, certainly my money, and um, and therefore the currency's been debased, and so we need more of it in exchange for our services, which are actually probably slightly increasing uh, year on year. By which I mean our sort of skills and our breadth of uh, treatments. So, <clears throat> the way you do it on my system, which is uh, SFD, is you copy the old fee scale over to a new fee scale, you just give it a starting date and you tell it how much you want to put them up. Um, and then you have to do a couple of other things. Uh, first of all, uh, we don't tr uh, include the examination and uh, scan and polish in those, uh, and to a certain extent the extractions in those fee scales. Uh, those headline fees, we think about very hard because they're the ones that are um, most often experienced by patients and therefore uh, have a lot of effect on your marketing and your recruitment and stuff like that. Your recruitment, retention and the motivation of your patients. <laughs> Hello, who is it going a bit fast and got the corner a bit fast? So... Um, so at the moment we're charging £45 for a checkup, and I'm quite happy charging that and uh, we're charging, uh, we used to charge 58 and and uh, what we're doing is we're charging uh, £78 for a scan and polish because of the AGP, the uh, uh, aerosol generating procedure nature of it. Now you can, you can bet your life that people find a way. This is so, this is characteristic of the relationship between dentists and the Department of Health. The Department of Health sets the rules and closes a load of loopholes and thinks that they've done something academically quite clever. And then the dentists then show them the, the floor, <laughs> the floor in their plan. So, for example, um, the best uh, way of uh, commissioning dentistry, I think, was the way that they used to do it, where they just paid per filling because there were so many fillings that there was not mu there was not much motivation for um, 
dentist to do unnecessary fillings. And if they did, then it tended to be like if they were filling a six and the, the five was numb, they would fill the five as well if it didn't need doing. And so all their fillings showed up as in binaries. Anyone who's doing a load of binary fillings is obviously fiddling the system. And anyone who's, you know, I mean, the, the uh, fiddling fiddling the system under a fee-for-item scheme is, is pretty difficult because, not least because the system generates a lot of data. And Eastbourne used to crunch all that data and they got very good at uh, detecting when people were abusing it at the fringes. And it was at the, the fringes were the only place where it was abused. But then, um, so then they bring in a system whereby uh, dentists are paid a flat rate for, for one of three types of course of treatment, little, medium and large. And uh, then other abuses follow, you know. Not abuses, I would say, I mean, sticking, in this case, it, it involves sticking within the rules. But, you know, finding one filling and then six months later finding another filling and then six months later finding another filling which may or may not all have been there on the first visit uh, so that you can claim three filling courses and instead of one filling course where you did three fillings two of which you didn't get paid for and this you know is the stupidity on behalf of the dentists are the dentists taking the piss or is the department of health taking the piss by coming up with a system where you get paid the same for one filling as you do for 10 you know I would say the Department of Health has the uh, has the whip hand in this Whoa. somebody flashed me to come out so <clears throat> what we've done we've just put the fees up and then uh, but then um, you have to then adjust the uh, examination and scale and polish fees down and anything else that's sort of totemic like perhaps a single extraction or an out of hours fee <coughs> excuse me and then um, what you have to do then is you have to up to date up to date up <coughs> you have to update your website and uh, the reason why you update the website is because our fees are online and uh, not all of them but I mean you know like sort of fillings from dentures from blah 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 so we have to make sure that that is accurate um, and that's because that's the face that's the patient facing database we have two sources of absolute truth regarding the fees Internally, it's the SFD database, the system that when you type the treatment in, it comes up, you know, type the treatment plan in, it comes up with a quote. So those are the accurate, accurate fees. And then you have, um, if a patient wants to know what we charge, then they go to the website and uh, then they can, they can, that then reflects our SFD internal database. Now, the reason why it's a good idea, I'll just put my wing mirror back out. The reason why it's a good idea to do it like that is because um, you really don't want to have multiple sources of fees. So, for example, if you go on Yahoo and you know, and you say something like dentures typically from, uh, or let's put a better example. Let's supposing someone messages you or leaves a message on Google or something and says, how much do you charge for an extraction? And you say, uh, I don't know, 90 quid or 50 quid or whatever you charge. And then like five years later, that'll still be on there. So you're better off saying like all our fees are online at firstimpressions.dental forward slash fees. Because then um, the patients will always get the most up-to-date patient facing copy of your fee scan. And then the other consideration, of course, is that your, our, our quotations are valid for 30 days. So, uh, let's, uh, I've got a new patient coming in at 9 o'clock this morning, and he'll be the last patient to get a quote at the old fee scale, because I've forward dated it, so it starts on Monday. So, uh, now, 
should he decide to uh, go ahead with his treatment, he's got 30 days to decide whether, you know, uh, uh, up to which point those fees are fixed. But the problem is that because we haven't put the fees up for a year or two, everybody's got into the habit, and in particular we've got into the habit of just assuming that if someone says, after six months oh, I'll get my treatment done, um, that um, the fees that are on their treatment plan are the fees that are, you know we need to charge. Whereas in fact now what's going to happen is anyone whose treatment is more than a month out of date uh, will need it will need to be retreatment planned at the new prices. I did say to one woman who came in yesterday who needed a bridge that if she wanted to have it done she should. Eddie Merckx there, look. I'm trying to get killed. I'm absolutely trying. I said that you know she should if she wants to get her bridge done she should lock in the price. Uh, because on Monday we're putting the fees up 10% and she thought about it for a second and then I think she decided that it was, uh, it was an American style uh, attempt to induce some FOMO some fear of missing out on the low prices and so she said that oh, I probably won't I probably, what she said was I won't decide today I won't decide today which is fine that's a no it doesn't matter I said to her you know if I was her I probably wouldn't wouldn't want a bridge there anyway so but I'm just out of courtesy because I'm so nice to people and I don't want, you know, I don't want her to come in next week and say, you know, I, I think I'll have that bridge. <coughs> and I have to say to her, look, I'm sorry, but what a shame you didn't tell me last week because if you told me last week, it was 10% less. But anyway, so, so, uh, I mean, I don't know even whether I should have told her that we were putting the fees up 10%. Because what the fees are, you know, I mean, someone comes in, they have something wrong, they get a quote, that's the quote, isn't it? They don't know whether that's 10% more or less than we were charging last week, next week, special offer, whatever. Certainly, we're, we're cheap on the route fillings. We were doing molar route fillings for, well, we were doing for 3 dollars 4 dollars I think. Then we lately we started charging five ninety nine for them because we realised that we were underpriced and then and then that's really one of the big factors that sort of fed into thinking perhaps we better put prices up as a whole. We don't tend to look at other dentist prices in the area. We're not you know we're not a dentist who says oh we'll undercut so and so by five percent or we'll um, we'll do a market survey or ring around and find out what people are charging. Um, I think if we did our prices would be higher what we tend to do is we tend to set them as low as uh, <laughs> sort of just survival level you know so that we can still pay the bills um, and and that's good because I think from a competitive market point of view that's really good uh, it's a strange where in a way not not finding out what your competitors are charging is the best way for a competitive market to exist. The best way is for everybody to decide what is the least amount of money they can survive on and uh, and then uh, you know just set the fees accordingly and then what happens is the patients then do the ringing round. Um, so we're still using the uh, uh, Calajex, the uh, uh, computer injection system. Um, it doesn't have any of the bells and whistles of the uh, uh, of the other systems. It's still, it still is very much like a Back to the Future type. Looks like it's been invented and assembled by somebody in their garage. But uh, you know, it's from a marketing point of view, it's it's not too bad. Um, it's got several drawbacks though I might might do a podcast on just on the Calajax but it's simple stuff like um, supposing you're doing a root filling and uh, you uh, uh, get to the uh, you, you get down the canals and one of the canals is a bit sensitive so what you want to do is you want to dribble a bit of local anaesthetic down the canal and Normally, you know, it's second nature just to reach out and grab the syringe and dribble a bit of anaesthetic in there, but 
with, with the cal eject, it's you either have to have it set up a separate syringe or, or it's a complete faff, you have to retract the plunger, change the cartridge over, uh, bleed the cartridge of air, and then, uh, you know, you might, then, then you're ready to dribble a bit of anaesthetic in. And that probably might take a minute, which doesn't sound long, but you know, it's not, it's not a second, which is what it used to take. And then, other th I mean, you have to bleed every cartridge. You can't, it won't start injecting, uh, or it, you shouldn't really start injecting with it straight away. What happens is the plunger moves up until it feels the the cartridge and it squirts, a, you know, a couple of, a bit of anaesthetic, about a hundredth of the cartridge out, comes out through the needle. I mean, and that's, um, so, so okay, well you think, all right, well they're sterile, but <clears throat> it's not sterile. <coughs> <coughs> the first cartridge is sterile, but when you swap the cartridges over, I'm gonna sneeze now because of the light. Yeah, but <clears throat> you think it's sterile, but it's not. The first cartridge is sterile. But then when you swap the cartridge over, that needle's already been in the patient's tissues. And so then when you bleed the second cartridge, you're bleeding it through a non-sterile needle. So then where do you squirt that? You know, do you squirt it? <clears throat> the first one, you can... And, and to see it bleeding, you have to have it up against a black background. So if you're wearing black trousers, that's great, because you can see it squirting out and, uh, and it goes on your trousers or on the floor or something. But you can't do that with the second one. The second one you have to squirt into a cotton wool roll or onto a gauze or somewhere. But you can't just go squirting it on the floor or even on uh, all over the tray or something, because it comes out, right? It's a proper squirt, you know, it does a couple of feet. So, you have to be very careful with that infected, or potentially infected, uh, 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 first uh, bit of local from the, from the second syringe on, and subsequent syringes. This is not addressed in their, uh, in their instructions. And then other things like strangely, like your when you when you uh, do this cal eject, you have to. My my tip is to get the cal eject all set up and ready, and then get the patient to adjust their head, and you adjust the light and get your mirror so that you can see the area that you're going to inject very well. Without the without the syringe, just so that you can just see it. And then, um, and then you sort of use the cal eject and sort of almost like a dart, you can sort of just put it on the skin and just gently push it in. But when you get to the point where the injection is pretty much painless, from the patient's point of view, they then tend to concentrate on the one bit that you can't make pain free, which is just the bit where it pushes through the skin. And uh, we use topical anaesthetic. I mean, we, we use topical anaesthetic. So, but even then, the patients wince. And it's, you know, it's a bit frustrating because you think, you know, we've spent 3,000 pounds on this auto injector. It injects uh, slowly, you know, at a reasonable rate. It puts another minute on the appointment because we're, we're doing your injection so, so carefully. And yet, it's, n it's still not. The, the patients are still thinking, no, uh, you know, all right, let me put it this way. When you afterwards you say to the patient, how was that? Or uh, could you feel anything? They'll, they'll, they'll still say, yeah, yeah, I could still feel, you know, I felt it a bit or, uh, you know, um, it was, it was not, it's not totally painless. Um, and so, so you then think to yourself, well, look, if you're, if you're going to lose, you know, if you're on a losing wicket, why bother walking out with a bat? Especially a 3,000 pound bat. You're better off just um, 
you know, uh, being uh, careful about how you how you do injections anyway. Anyway, um, still on dental. We um, I was watching some uh, videos yesterday on uh, on YouTube, and there's a ton of uh, videos on how to take alginate impressions. There's a ton. There's a ton designed for new dental nurses just to explain what alginate is and how you mix it and there's a ton on uh, crown and bridge impressions and how to take two phase impressions for crown and bridges um, but <laughs> the one what I'm interested in is alginate impressions just really really good fully formed alginate impressions uh, with no bubbles in particular when you because we've started casting up our own impressions and um, you know you get these tiny little really annoying bubbles around the gingival margin and I don't even know what they are they're, they're just you know I don't know whether they're saliva bubbles or <coughs> <coughs> bubbles of air in the alginate that have got a uh, you know, but why Why would they always be on the gingival margin? So, if you're gonna take an impression, someone, the, the, the truest thing that they said in the videos was that alginate impressions, people think are the simplest thing that dentists do, whereas in fact they're not. They're actually one of the most complicated thing that dentists do. And I'm getting to the point now where we've got our own light cured special tray material. I'm thinking of using special trays for absolutely everything. Because if you were, if you look at the, my impressions with a critical eye, I mean, really a critical eye, and we are well above the general standard. I mean, when I go to my technician, he shows me some of the funnier impressions he's taken, and I struggle to understand how they could make them so bad. I don't even understand how they've done it. Honestly, I don't. You know, you get something that looks like the landscape of Mars with a couple of teeth sticking up out of somewhere that's not even identifiable as a ridge. And he said that the the the, uh, the thing is that you know, they're given with an instruction just to please take straight to fit. And I can only assume that it's some sort of fiddle because I can't imagine that uh, it's more uh, cost effective to stand there for half an hour and make something like that fit than it is to stand there for three minutes and just take a better impression. So I only assume that they give these dentures to the patients and the patients then just throw them away. Because there's no way they can they can fit or work. Anyway, uh, one of the one of the uh, dentists there was exactly what I wanted. It's like hyper anal about alternate impressions and measures them out to the gram, which we do with the plaster rather than, uh, you know, uh, just sort of taking a handful, which is what the technician does, and chucking it in the water. And, um, uh, what is that bloke doing? I've got a feeling that they record the number plates of all the cars that come in and out. But there's no uh, sign up saying that there, there's any sort of surveillance of number plates. So I might just drop a letter to the school asking them if they've got, you know, who, who the data controller is. <clears throat> anyway, we put the feeds up. We'll wait and see. We've had, well, literally, in the first half of the year, we've had four. 100 new patients, over 400. We were, funny enough, we were looking for 40. Because <laughs> we put the, um, I think we put the uh, checkup charge down from 49 to 45 to get, get it under the uh, tap and pay limit. And we worked out that we'd need 40 new patients having checkups to make up the loss of revenue on the, on the thousand people who are gonna pay four pound less. And, um, and and we've got 400 new patients, so I can see us next year putting it down again because putting prices down sometimes makes you money, but then sometimes putting them up <laughs> does as well. 
So anyway, I hope that's been helpful. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.